Hey guys, Dan with Philosophical Fishing. And I had my friend Mark from the channel um, ask me to make a video about depression and dealing with depression in the early days of benzo withdrawal. And again, thank you guys for all your comments. Thank you for all of your support. You guys have given me so much support on this channel, just getting it up and going. And I've only been doing it for a short time, just a little bit over a month. And um, you guys have left me so many great comments and it, it gives me a lot of motivation to keep going and keep doing this. So thank you guys, first of all. And thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark, for the suggestion um, on making this video about dealing with early benzo withdrawal and depression and 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 those tough emotions that come along with the early days of of dealing with life and walking through life with a, with a more of a clear head and and not using benzos every day it's hard it's really hard and uh, I'm no stranger to depression myself I I kind of feel like as far back as I can remember I've kind of always dealt with depression on some level um, you know, I, I remember even as a little kid dealing with depression and feeling this sense of like sadness and this kind of sense of, um, I always had a lot of anxiety as a little kid, you know, I can remember even as far back as probably second or third grade, I had this like intense fear of, uh, of earthquakes. And I remember always going to my parents and uh, I would cry and, and tell them that I had this fear of of this huge earthquake coming and, and destroying our home and, and us getting hurt. And I lived in Illinois where there's absolutely no earthquakes at all. So it's kind of funny that I even had this fear. But even as a little kid, I can just remember kind of feeling different and feeling kind of sensitive to, to things and I always felt like I was a little extra sensitive to life and things affected me deeply. I've always been a deep feeler and um, it's just part of who I am and I can't control it. There's nothing I can do about it. I just, it's part of who I am and I have to learn to, to accept it and live with it on some level. You know, so in a way, it's probably not much of a surprise or shouldn't be much of a surprise that when I found benzos and alcohol and other drugs that it kind of gave me this feeling of like protection, like a barrier between me and the world where I could actually go out and function and feel like I had some insulation on me because without, without the benzos and without, without alcohol and other drugs, I always kind of felt like too, too naked and exposed to the world. Like everything that came at me was just too was too harsh like it was always pins and needles coming at me and uh and I had no defense against it I would just feel everything and maybe I'm more empathic as well maybe that plays a part and I kind of talked about this a little bit in in my last video um where do I go from here now that I'm off of benzodiazepines and and how do I deal with these emotions and how do I deal with with sadness or um, shame, because that was a big one for me too. I felt this intense sense of shame for who I am, for what I had done. I felt weak, I felt ineffective. I felt like I needed to get it together for my family. And I, I saw them kind of struggling, you know, without having the father of the household to, to help and to provide and just to be there, you know, I was just a drain on my family and I was, um, I drained our resources, I drained my family's emotions, I drained their time and, and I took a lot. I took, I took many things from my family in, in my addiction and in my benzodiazepine use. And so there's this analogy that we use in recovery. We talk about, you know, getting sober or getting the drugs out of our system and by the way, when I say this term sober and I refer to myself as an alcoholic or an addict, I just want to say that I know that that's not the case for everybody. I think that most people were actually inadvertently damaged by benzodiazepines and they were prescribed something by their doctor that they took thought would help them and it ended up being 
what benzodiazepine use is incredibly destructive and so there's I think more often than not most people are not true addicts and alcoholics they're just somebody who got hooked and dependent upon a medication and then found it difficult to come off of and and just got incredibly damaged by them I believe the term is iatrogenic harm but anyway we talk about this phenomenon in recovery where when we're taking benzos or using or drinking it's like we're driving this car and we're throwing all our trash in the back seat of the car as we're driving you know every time you get something you know something fast food or whatever it is or you just take it and you wad it up and you throw it in the back seat and forget about it and then getting sober or getting the drugs out of our system or coming off of benzos it's like slamming on the brakes and all that shit that was in the back seat all of a sudden flies up into the front seat and now you're sitting in all that garbage that you've just been thrown in the back for how many weeks or months or in my case years you know well over a decade now I'm I'm off benzos and I'm sitting in this pile of garbage and and it's hard you know it's it's tough I think the number one thing I had to do when I came off of benzos was just keep it simple. Keep it simple and learn to take it easy on myself. Learn to take it easy on myself and take it easy on others. Everybody, including you and me and everybody watching this video, we are all trying to do the best that we can in this life. Everybody's trying to do their best. And if I can learn to just take it easy and remember to take it easy on others and take it easy on myself and keep it simple, then I can undo a lot of the unnecessary stress that's on me. And what do I mean by keep it simple? I just mean stay in the day, stay in the moment, I don't have to figure out my entire life right now, today. I don't have to figure out next week where I'm gonna work or next month where I'm gonna work right now, today and have it all figured out. I just need to take one step at a time today. One thing I do is I talk to myself a lot and it actually helps me because um, it helps me stay present in what I'm doing, especially when I'm feeling overwhelmed or depressed or anxious. Literally, as I'm doing whatever I'm doing, I'll talk to myself, not necessarily out loud, sometimes I do, but it'll be really, really simple, such as I'm putting on my left sock now. Okay, now I'm putting on my right sock. Now I'm putting on my left shoe. Now I'm putting on my right shoe. Now I'm getting the kids in the car now I'm taking them to the park or whatever it is I'll just talk to myself as I go throughout my day and that really helps me stay present it helps me to just be where I'm at and not try to focus on everything that's going on everything that's going wrong or trying to figure out my entire life in this instant because I can't do that it's it's too much for anybody to do and I think a lot of us who used benzodiazepines or put on benzodiazepines I think a lot of us have a tendency to to project to catastrophize and to try to figure out solutions to problems all right now at the same time and it's completely overwhelming and it's too much and so whether you're religious or spiritual or atheist or agnostic this is kind of where I start to get into the spiritual aspect of coming off of benzos and coping with benzodiazepine withdrawal in the early phases and still now is that I utilize prayer all the time every day for me personally I I was raised in the church and I was brought to evangelical church every Sunday until I was probably 16 years old. And then I decided for me, I was just, I was done with the church. I wasn't going to do it anymore. 
I never really liked going anyway. I kind of always felt like an outsider. I never really bought the whole story that I was being told. And if you are religious, I don't want to discourage you from practicing your religion at all. You know, there's a lot of people who find solace and comfort, joy and meaning and purpose in their religion. And I would be remiss to try to dissuade anybody from practicing something where they find so much substance and so much meaning in their lives. So by all means, if you're religious and it works for you and, you know, keep doing it. But for me, I was, I was brought up in the church. I left at 16 and I kind of became agnostic and and even atheist for a little while and then through a series of experiences most of them very difficult hard situations I kind of came around to just more of an open mind like maybe there's something out there um, I don't know what it is I don't think it's the the God that I was brought up with like this you know old man in the sky with a beard throwing lightning bolts at people but I had this kind of like vague amorphous conception of of something in the universe and today all it is for me is a it's a creative intelligence underlying the totality of things and I can't define it I don't know what it is I can't define it for myself and I can't define it for anybody else but for me I know that there's something about prayer that really works and I don't mean works in the way that I used to try to make prayer work, which was, God, please give me what I want. I want this situation to to unfold this way, or I want this situation to have this kind of outcome. It's not that at all. Although I'm always going to have desires, of course, but what I do today is I just ask the universe for help, for guidance, for direction and oftentimes I have the sense of letting go and letting the universe show me teach me and bring to me what it will and that's fundamentally different than trying to ask the universe to serve my will and what I think is best and how I want things to be when I was in rehab coming off of benzos, I would go in the bathroom and I would get down on my knees on the toilet and on the counter and I would just cry. I would just pray my heart out and I would pray my soul out and I would just ask God to please help me. And please help is I think the most simple and the most effective prayer that I could ever utilize because it's honest, it's direct, and when I was that beaten down, I mean, I had no, when I was in that facility, I had no cognitive function. I couldn't even hardly put words together. I could barely get up and go to the cafeteria to eat a little something and just walk down the hall. I felt like I was gonna pass out. Every time I stood up, I had to hold on to the railing as I was going down the hallway. I felt like I was gonna freaking die. And I don't know if I've ever said a more honest, direct, sincere prayer in my entire life as those six weeks when I was in treatment and I just asked God and begged God for help. You know, and the thing is, I got out of the psych wards, I got out of the treatment center, and, and I started to get my life back. And I think the thread running through that entire experience was this turning over of my life to whatever it is that's in the universe that has creative power. Because I look at a tree or a rock or the sky or the Grand Canyon or a dog and I think, you know, I can't make one of those out of scratch. There's no way, you know, something else made that and, and that something else is not me. And so it's a very simple way of just thinking about and opening my mind to a possible concept of 
some other creative intelligence in the universe other than me. You know, I think going through life when I think it's just me and I'm this separate entity just kind of like floating through the world on my own trying to figure things out. It's a very lonely business and, and I did that for a long time. And what I've come to realize is that I'm not anymore. You know, and it sounds cliche to say that we're all connected and we're all one. But I really sense that today. I really do sense that we're not alone. We are all part of this creative intelligence. And we're just different expressions of that creative intelligence. I'm getting out there. Oh, God, good. <laughs> And that creative intelligence that you could call God or Krishna or whatever you want to call it or Allah, that creative intelligence is living a life through us. We are all expressions of God and God is living its life through us in this dimension of reality that we find ourselves in. And I also believe that we chose to come here. We chose to incarnate in these bodies on this earth and to have this experience. Why? I'm not sure. But I think we're all here to play a part. You know, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely actors and one man in his life plays many parts. I don't mean to get too all metaphysical on you guys, but you know, I'm, I'm sharing what has helped me and things that I've come to understand and to realize through the process of coming off benzos. Because as I've mentioned before, it's been a very deep spiritual experience for me coming off them and, and walking through life with a clear head. Also, I was reading Mark's comment last night and he was talking about how he was trying to just do things around the house, like try to clean the house and try to do small tasks and how much his back hurt and he felt so heavy getting out of bed. And I completely identify with that. I, I remember that a hundred percent. I remember feeling like my, my head weighed a thousand pounds and it was being electrocuted. And every time I would try to get up off the couch or get out of bed, it felt like I was lifting arms and legs made of lead. I felt so heavy. I had no energy. I couldn't drink caffeine because I was completely intolerant to it. Caffeine would just send me into a huge wave. I was always hunched over from anxiety uh, and I was just absolutely miserable. I was wretched. So I get that. You know, this, this drug damages our brains and our bodies equally. But again, I try to bring it back to not focusing on the totality and the whole of what I'm trying to do and not focusing on I, I have to do all this right now but what can I do right now in this moment and even if that's just one little thing maybe if that's I get up and I washed a couple dishes or I fed the dog or I fed the cat you know and then sit down breathe take some deep breaths And as miserable as it oftentimes is, taking a deep breath and becoming present in the moment with where you're at is very helpful and it's a great practice and it's something that I continue to practice today. You know, especially in those early months of benzo withdrawal and post withdrawal and post acute withdrawal, our minds tend to play a lot of tricks on us. And one thing I also used to use was using my sense perception to keep me grounded. And so often I would take a lot of walks and I would picture two arrows coming out of my eyeballs. And I know this sounds silly, but I swear to God it helped. And I may have shared this in a past video, but I can't remember. But I used to envision two arrows coming out of my eyes and focusing on the external stimuli around me. So if I see, like right now I'm in a parking lot and I'm looking at a red brick building, 
then I would just tell myself, red brick building. Or I would picture the arrows coming out of my eyes and I would see a tree and I would look at it and say, okay, that's a tree, that's a red brick building, there's a person walking over there. Literally, I'm calling out things I see in this parking lot. Uh, there's some shopping centers around me, there's some cars, there's a bus over there. And just doing that is like a mind switch. And it can get me out of this constant stream of thoughts in my head and just look at the things around me and stop that, that mind, that constant mind loop that's always going and helps me to just slow down and then take a breath, breathe, and then ask myself, okay, what am I doing? What am I doing right now? What can I do right now? And just take it easy on yourself. Your body and your mind and your spirit is going through so much right now. And I know it's hard for people around you to understand and they really can't. I mean, how could they understand what you're going through? Only somebody who has been through this and experienced it knows what it feels like and what the limitations are on you as you're going through this process. So give yourself some grace. Let yourself just be. Let yourself breathe. Let yourself experience going through the process. Also, I had to stay away from negativity as much as possible and negativity of any kind. I couldn't do social media. I had to disable my Facebook account. Looking at that would just feel triggering to me because I would see people living their lives and and doing all this cool stuff. And I was just, I was not in a state where I could even think about being, uh, being a regular member of society or or enjoying life as I once did, or enjoying life as I saw people my age doing. So I had to completely withdraw my attention from those things, because if I focused on them, it was only gonna bring me down. And, and I made my life very, very small for a while and very simple. I mostly hung out with family members, and, and I started to make friends slowly in recovery. I stopped watching violent movies um, I stopped watching the news and if somebody was trying to engage me in a conversation that I didn't want a part of I would have to excuse myself and I just I, I listened to a lot of positive music a lot of things that made me feel good a lot of the music that I used to listen to had a very negative um, very dark emotional message and well I still love a lot of that music I had to set that aside for a while and and take that out of my conscious. And it's a difficult process going through. It's just there's there's nothing that you can do to speed up the process of healing. You have to just let it be and let it go on its own timeline and try not to put any expectations on yourself or on your healing. Everybody's gonna heal at a little bit different pace and a little bit different timeline. So for me, I was unemployed for the first six months off of Benzos. And even that first job that I got, it was a part-time job mixing paint at a hardware store. And it was challenging at first. I mean, it, you know, my, my, my nervous system and my muscles were still just so racked with pain and uncomfortable that it was really hard. My benzo belly was, it was freaking ridiculous. You know, I still struggle with that. But I did do it and I got through it and it showed me that I could go back to work. You know, but it didn't all happen overnight. And there were days where I was just almost despondent and I felt like my body was shutting down because it was just too much. The, the, the sadness was too much, the anxiety was too much, and my, my thoughts were just running so fast that it felt like I was like a broken clock with like springs sticking out of it and I was just about to completely explode and come apart. 
And what I did in those times was um, I just reached out to somebody in, in recovery. For me, my recovery community has been absolutely paramount to, to my healing. And I know that's not the case for everybody. Not everybody is an alcoholic or an addict like me. And I think, I think what we need to do, all of us who are in benzodiazepine withdrawal or, or post-benzo withdrawal, I think that we need some sort of community. I think we need a support system of people who have been through it. You know, because that's exactly what we do in my recovery community is we can identify with each other as people who are drug addicts and alcoholics and we are the ones who are able to help each other because you know the medical community while they are well intentioned most of the time they can't help us like we can help each other because we're the ones who have walked through it we've had that experience and we've come out the other side and we're the ones who can reach our hands back down and help pull the other ones up and I think all of us need a community like that where people like me who are almost seven years off of benzos can reach out and help pull others out of the darkness and into the light. Because I understand it, I've been through it, I've had that experience. I know what it takes to overcome it and what to do and how to help somebody else. You know, unfortunately, as far as I know, there aren't meetings held for people who are benzo addicted or have problems with benzodiazepines. There might, there might be Benzodiazepine Anonymous. I don't know if I've ever really researched it or looked it up, but if there is, I would say that the meetings are probably very few and far between. Um, and there's, as far as I know, there's not literature for it or, or any real system of support or any network of people who are at the ready to help somebody who's just coming off of benzos. So that's why we're kind of right now, we're in this very dark age of benzodiazepine withdrawal for people because people are first of all stuck on these drugs and they're imprisoned in this chemical nightmare that they can't see any way out of and there's no medical protocol nowhere for them to go nowhere to go get help to try to come off these drugs except maybe a treatment center like where I went which almost killed me so until we find a way and a means of having us come together in connection and community, I think we're still going to experience people trying to go through this on their own as best they can and reaching out for help to, to others who have come off of it and maybe people like me who are making YouTube videos or Facebook groups, you know, and aside from that, the medical community really doesn't have a grasp on how devastating this is yet. Most people that I've talked to and that I've written to and that have contacted me have basically said that when they went back to their doctor to try to get off benzos, the doctor wanted to just take them off either right away or rapidly wean them in a couple weeks. And as we all know, that's not the right way to do it. It takes a long time, it takes patience, it takes perseverance, and it takes an understanding and willing medical professional to help wean people off of benzos slowly and over time. And it's almost impossible to find a doctor who's willing to do that. And there's millions of people taking benzos right now, not just here in the US, but just here in the US, there's been over 30.5 million prescriptions written, I believe in 2020 alone. So I feel like there's this giant wave coming that's going to break within the next couple of years. And we're going to see so many people who are stuck on these drugs and are trying to come off these drugs and, and are going through these horrible, horrible symptoms and this drug just ripping people's lives apart. I think we're going to start seeing treatment centers and facilities popping up dedicated to trying to help people with benzodiazepine withdrawal. We're not there yet. We're still trying to navigate through this ourselves. 
and reaching out for hope and help in any way we can or any way we can find it. And that's why my heart goes out to all of you and everybody watching this video because I know what it's like. I've been there. I've walked in your shoes. I get it. All of our life circumstances are different in ways, but as far as that feeling of despair, dread, depression, anxiety, hopelessness, I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to want to end your life. I know what it feels like to want to give up. I know what it feels like to think I'm just so broken. I should just be shot like a horse who's broken its leg. There's just nothing left for me. I know what that feels like. And I also know what it feels like to come out of that and to start living a new life and to start putting one foot in front of the other one day at a time, slowly. Also, I wanted to mention exercise as being something that you can work with to try to bring you out of anxiety and depression. When I was about 90 days sober off of benzos, I went through this dark, dark depression. And I remember I was talking to somebody one evening and I was telling him that I felt like I was going to either end it or I was going to go back to using benzodiazepines and I just didn't know what to do. And he suggested to me that I go to the gym or start exercising to try to naturally boost those chemicals in my brain that were so depleted and missing. And so I started going to this gym and I started going on the treadmill, you know, first for like a half a mile and then a mile and then a mile and a half. And I was never really good on treadmills. I'm not a runner, but I started using weights and I started lifting and I started to feel better after I was doing that and it really helped me and it's something that I still do today I just went to the gym this morning and that's hard for some people you know some people's bodies are so jacked up that it's it's almost impossible for them to get to the gym or to do any kind of physical activity at all um, and some people it seems to exacerbate the symptoms and actually make them worse because working out especially if you're using heavier weights um, it is taxing on the nervous system and the nervous system sometimes doesn't like it. So, you know, it doesn't have to be weightlifting. It doesn't have to be, you know, something where you're trying to add muscle or burn a lot of fat. It can just be something where you, you're using very light weights or light resistance or light resistant bands. Uh, yoga seems to help a lot of people. But for me, long walks were really, really good. Um, if you have a bike or can ride a bike or have bike trails nearby wherever you live, that's also really, really good. Um, I love doing that. I love putting my earbuds in and going for long bike rides. Um, where I used to live in Florida, it was really flat, so it was it was a lot easier. Now I live in North Carolina and it's it's hilly and, and mountainy in a lot of places, so it's actually it's a lot more challenging. But you know, wherever your level is at with your tolerance to exercising and your physical ability to exercise you know everybody can do something you know even if you're sitting in a chair using resistance bands or using very light dumbbells um, or you can just walk around the block everybody can probably do something you know some more than others so exercising is is key it really helps reboot the brain and get those healthy chemicals going naturally and it takes time to to rebuild and restore those those chemicals that have been depleted by benzodiazepines. So, Mark, my friend, hang in there, brother. I've been where you are, and I know that you can come out of it, and I know that you will come out of it, man. Thomas, thank you for your suggestions, too, and thank you all who have supported this channel so far. You guys are the reason that I keep doing it. And your support makes me want to keep making these videos to help people. I wish you all love and light. And I wish you all healing. And if anybody has any more ideas for content or a video they'd like me to do, please reach out, leave me a comment. Again, you can follow me on Instagram at Philosophical Fishing. I've also started a TikTok channel 
called Philosophical Fishing. I've got some ideas for books I'd like to write. But in the meantime, let's just keep trying to help each other and lift each other up because it's totally possible to recover from this and come out the other side no matter where you're at. I hope this video has helped and thank you guys for watching. I love you.